Good evening. The enemy in Afghanistan now is broadly understood to be the Taliban. They, of course, were routed by the U.S. and the Northern Alliance at the beginning of the war, only to return in force. From afar, uh, the Taliban are simply the bad guys. But how they affect Afghan society, how to fight them, and who should fight them are subjects worth looking at from close up, which is one thing we tried to do on our recent trip into the war zone. We're here at checkpoint uh, 710, which is between Kandahar City and uh, the Argandab district. And we're here with uh, third lieutenant uh, Jumal Gal, who is part of the ANCOP, the Afghan National Civil Order Police, which has partnered with U.S. forces here uh, to run this checkpoint. Uh, lieutenant, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, why did you join ANCOP? Because like, you know, I joined the INCA because to serve my country. Was the training very good? It's very good training. The first time we came here, so it's good. And we have good training. Are you from southern Afghanistan or are you from somewhere else in the country? We tell the Jinnum on the Kyoko the Bulipai. Zadi Kabul. He's from Kabul. Do you think that it's good to have police from Kabul, from the rest of the country, uh, rather than local police here? Kabuli, Kandahari, Irati, Yelmandi. Yeah, he's saying like that. The, the police, they must be from every province, not just from Kabul or other province. It's, they're supposed to be from whole Afghanistan. Um, is it good that ANCOP is partnered with Americans here, or should this be all Afghan? This time next year, if it's all Afghan, will it still work? If we work together, that is, uh, that's going to be great. In the future, uh, when, uh, when Americans are gone, you think, just to be clear, uh, you think that this police outpost will serve the community, be good for the community with no Americans here? Uh, right now, he's saying, I don't, I don't think so, that uh, they will serve their country because they are not professional and their economy is not good. So that's why he's saying it's not possible right now. How long will it take? Uh, maybe one more year. I see. Um, please tell him I said thank you for his service to his country, and I appreciate his time. One more year, he says. Uh, that's good, because that's what he's got. That's the time that they've got before this mission that makes it possible for U.S. troops to be serving in such big numbers alongside Afghan troops at checkpoints like that one that you could see right there. That's how much they've got before this mission begins to end. We don't know exactly how fast the drawdown will go, but we do know that U.S. troops are to start to leave Afghanistan in a year, in July 2011. And that's the time by which that third lieutenant I spoke with in Kandahar thinks that Afghan police will be able to serve their community well without U.S. help. One of the interesting things about talking with him is that, as he said there, he used to live in Kabul. He's from Kabul. He's a shopkeeper from Kabul before he became a police officer. Why is a former shopkeeper from Kabul serving in Kandahar, nearly 300 miles from home? Well, part of it is that that's the way they're doing the policing. They're sending people from a national force all over the country. But another part of it is practical uh, in a very, very, very concrete sense. Imagine how hard it is to be a soldier or a police officer from a Taliban stronghold from a place like Kandahar. Imagine the pressure on your family if you are a man or a woman who wants to join up and you're from a Taliban stronghold. People who come from parts of Afghanistan where there is heavy Taliban presence, is it, uh, do people put their families at risk when they enlist in the army if the Taliban gets angry? There's no doubt that uh, their families, or the people who are coming from the areas where our Taliban more inf- uh, has more inf- influence, uh, their families will be at risk. But uh, this is what they, uh, with a strong determination, they want to come here and join the Afghan National Army. But there's also another thing. The people who are coming to join the Afghan National Army are coming from the areas where government has more influence. But we are getting very small number of the soldiers from the areas where Taliban I see. Are. Um, there are, uh, right now, one of the challenges with the Afghan army uh, is that uh, 
Afghan citizens who are from places where the Taliban or the insurgency is very strong don't want to join the army. Will that ever change? Maybe the Urdu job or Joshua knows that Aksariyad will have to fill in the Urdu car order. Yeah, so that, that will change because uh, as, as far as you can see that the people of Afghanistan are freed up from the fighting and they want now to be established their country and stay as, as free as they can. And that's, that's why we can hear from the different country, the provinces, people are coming and you know, recruiting themselves to Afghan National Army. So it's good news for us. Optimism mixed with a little hard-headed realism from the Afghans I talked with there, the Afghan police and soldiers that I talked with there about the Taliban. NBC's chief foreign correspondent, my friend Richard Engel, knows more about the Taliban than anybody else I have ever worked with in news. Here's what Richard thinks we all should understand about them to know what's at stake, especially if the Taliban are going to be called on to do a deal to end the war. It was here in the streets of Kandahar that the Taliban were born from the crucible of war. When Soviet troops withdrew from Afghanistan in defeat in 1989, civil war erupted. Warlords and opium dealers carved out fiefdoms. The country was on the brink of starvation. In Kandahar, a poor wheat farmer named Mullah Muhammad Omar offered a radical solution. Stability, he said, would come through strict Islamic justice and zero tolerance for drug trafficking and corruption. Mullah Omar attracted many young followers, especially Afghans who'd studied in Pakistani madrasas. They called themselves the Taliban, literally meaning religious students. The Taliban are Deobandi Muslims, a hardline evangelical sect of Sunni Islam. Many Deobandis believe it is their duty to rid the world of tyranny through jihad. And they were about to receive outside help. It came from Afghanistan's neighbor, Pakistan, eager to pursue its own interests. Pakistan's objective in Afghanistan has always been strategic. Pakistan wants a proxy in Afghanistan to strengthen its western flank in case of renewed war with Islamabad's bitter and larger enemy, India. The Pakistani intelligence agency, the ISI, also found the zealous Taliban willing to allow Pakistan to train Islamic militants to fight India in the contested lands of Kashmir. Backed by the ISI, the Taliban captured Kabul in 1996 and imposed shocking draconian laws. Music and even kites were outlawed. Women were denied education and forced to wear burqas. They were stoned for adultery. It wasn't long before the rogue Saudi billionaire Osama bin Laden came looking for a base to attack the United States. Mullah Omar welcomed bin Laden as a brother. From Afghanistan, bin Laden plotted the attacks of 9-11. But the Taliban may have misjudged the American response. The Taliban's army of some 30,000 fighters was quickly defeated. The survivors, including bin Laden, took refuge in the one place they knew they'd be safe, the mountains of Pakistan across the border. From Pakistan, the Taliban and al-Qaeda continued to fight. According to U.S. military estimates, the Taliban are now at roughly the same strength as before 9-11, with 28,000 fighters in Afghanistan, 13,000 in the south, 11 in the east, two in the north, and two more in the west. But there are signs the Taliban may be willing to make a deal. Wakil Ahmed Mutawakil was the Taliban's foreign minister. As a spokesman for Mullah Omar, he met bin Laden. Now in Kabul says the Taliban would be willing to break ties with al-Qaeda in exchange for power and peace. In the past, the Taliban were like the owners of the house, and al-Qaeda were guests here, he says. Now al-Qaeda are war partners. The Afghan government has foreign war partners. If peace exists, both sides won't need their foreign allies. The U.S.-backed Afghan President Hamid Karzai has made it clear he wants a deal with the Taliban. In a meeting this summer, he called on the militants to join a peace process. But those negotiations have been disorganized. Turkey, Libya, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Pakistan, 
The Maldives, Malaysia and Indonesia have all offered to broker talks. Mutawakil says the peace process needs to be streamlined and the Taliban need an office to organize negotiations. The Taliban should be removed from international blacklists, he says. Some prisoners should be released and the Taliban should be allowed to safely establish a political office in Afghanistan or in another country. Surprisingly, several senior U.S. military commanders agree. But would the Taliban really make peace with President Karzai. I'm very skeptical that it's going to go very far because I don't think the Taliban is interested in a political process. I think the Taliban has one intention for President Karzai, and that involves a lamppost and a piece of rope. In the mountains of eastern Afghanistan, a Taliban stronghold near the Pakistani border, we met Malavi Nasir, a 45-year-old Taliban field commander. He claims to be in charge of 300 fighters. I took up arms, he says, because the Americans terrorized our country. They are killing innocent people and bombing our villages. We are fighting to defend our religion. I won't stop fighting until foreign forces leave. While the rank and file of the Taliban's foot soldiers say they want to keep on fighting, senior U.S. military officials tell NBC News the Taliban's most senior leaders who are still in power.